the combined police forces in a, of an entire continent are focused on finding one man, the alleged ringleader behind the foiled Belgian terrorist plot to kidnap and kill police in that country. Let's go right to CNN terror analyst Paul Cruikshank. Uh, Paul, uh, there's been a lot of attention on this guy caught in Greece who is now being extradited to Belgium. What can you tell us about him? Is he the ringleader? Jake, I was just speaking to a senior Belgian counterterrorism official. Uh, the guy that's being extradited, an Algerian uh, towards Belgium, is not the guy that they suspect uh, is a, a key ringleader uh, in the plot. Uh, but they haven't completely discounted the possibility uh, that he also played a significant uh, role in this plot. Uh, they want to find out a lot more about this guy, uh, the role that he plays. He may have had a connection uh, to the uh, Belgian-Moroccan operative that they suspect uh, was the key uh, ringleader uh, in this plot. He uh, remains at large, still a threat. He's believed to have connections back to the ISIS leadership in Syria. Uh, the Belgians are increasingly sure that the senior leadership of ISIS signed off on this uh, uh, plot, Jake. All right. I also want to bring in CNN counterterrorism analyst uh, uh, Phil Mudd. Uh, Phil, I, I want to ask you about French intelligence today. Um, it, it seems as though some, some clear signals were missed. They got a tip, but it took them four months for them to share it with other law enforcement officials in the French government, and in that time, the Kouachis effectively disappeared. What explains the kind of lapse? Are they just overworked, too few law enforcement and counterterrorism officials, and too many people to track? That would be my initial reaction, Jake. There are some key questions here. You mentioned, one, the air gap between acquiring information from one agency and passing it to another. One of the big questions I have is we've seen multiple reports about travel through Oman to uh, either Yemen or Iraq back in 2011. How you miss travel on a target like this is a significant question in a security service. We're missing a huge piece of the puzzle, Jake, though, and that's what we'll find in the investigation. That is, you're triaging in the security service every day. Let's say you have several hundred targets, more targets coming in every day from Yemen, Iraq. So when those targets come in, you've got to have some kind of off the table. Here's the question. What else was on the table that led them to drop surveillance on this target? And is that one of the explanations for why this target was missed over time? How long, uh, Phil, how long do you think intelligence agencies should monitor someone when they first get a, a credible tip? Boy, that is a... <laughs> I hate to tell you, that is a terrific question. Here's the problem here. When you're talking about travel to either Yemen, Iraq, out to a war zone in 2011, and we're now in 2015, you, you do not follow targets for three or four or five years. I just didn't witness that. If someone's going over there for training, they're going to come back and typically act. I mentioned before triaging. If they don't act, let's say a year passes, two years pass, three years pass, an operations manager is going to say, how many resources are we going to spend on somebody when we don't have information that suggests they're going, to, they're, they're going to stage an operation? What about the guy who came in last month from Syria, Iraq, or Yemen? So to me, that's one of the fascinating aspects of this. What were these operatives waiting for? Why didn't they operate? And I suspect one of the things the investigation will show is that investigators said, we can't follow these guys around forever if we're not certain they're, they're up to something. Paul Cruikshank, uh, the estimated number of foreign fighters who have returned from Iraq and Syria to France is, is roughly 500. How, how can they even prioritize targets in a pool that big? Well, it's about 200 to France, more than 500 for the whole of the European Union. You're right. It's very, very difficult uh, to prioritize, uh, to figure out who, who you're going to watch. Um, and, and it's really, you know, as Phil would say, more of an art often than a science. Often uh, the information is, is very uh, fragmentary. Uh, indeed, and, and but in Belgium, we've just seen a, a very significant counterterrorism operation, the thwarting of what Belgians now believe was a major ambitious terrorist attack, uh, possibly against a sensitive target uh, in Belgium. It's, it was a big counterterrorism success from the Belgians, but they're telling me that just in the last few minutes, they're concerned still uh, that there's still a danger out there uh, in, in, in Belgium, that some of these cell members uh, are still at large. They haven't got the whole cell yet. And while they've disrupted the main thrust of the plot, uh, they, they believe that others may have access to weapons and may try to launch an attack for the death of their comrades in that operation you see on your screen right now uh, in Verviers last week, Jake. So, Phil Mudd, uh, given that news that Paul just said about the, the fear that this Belgian cell that was raided 
has connections to other terrorist cells throughout Europe. What steps uh, would counterintelligence official, I'm sorry, counterterrorism officials in Europe be taking right now that they weren't already taking? Boy, the first is the intense interrogation of the people in custody, because they know the answer to a couple of questions. Let me give you the two I would ask, neither of which have anything to do with what just happened in Paris and Belgium. First, are there any other imminent attacks? Speak now. The second, and this is a piece that will take months to sort of uh, to, to investigate who else is out there. Terrorism in my world was not a game of threats or of locations that might be targeted. It was a game of people. Any interrogation of a subject is going to include the preliminary question, not of what just happened, but of who else is out there, what are their names, where are their travel routes, who else are they con connected with in terms of acquiring weapons, explosives, money, so that I can go out and find them. I want to interrogate those guys immediately about other people. And I suspect when you're seeing other raids across Europe, the same questions are being asked of everybody who's being brought in by, every, by, by services in places like Germany, Spain, Italy, etc. Phil Mudd, Paul Crookshank, thank you both so much.